it's my pleasure to announce next series of lectures by Jan Pijo Vencogi. The title is on the work and introduction to KM theory. Yes. Thank you. Thank you for the introduction and thank you for the chance of speaking here. I'm very happy. So the goal of these lectures is really to give an introductory, very elementary introduction to KM theory, which is usually understood as a collection of ideas and techniques that apply to several dynamical systems, mostly in a perturbative settings. So the first idea is really done by Kolmogorov in the 50s. And these ideas were later put to work and actually formalized by Vladimir Arnold and uh, Jürgen Moser. And uh, where the acronym KM comes from, the contributions Kolmogorov Arnold Moser. So what did they exactly do? So Kolmogorov announced and sketched a proof of the following statements. So on the persistence of quasi-periodic motions in analytic near integral Hamilton. I will explain today in the lecture what every word of this means. It's just to wanted to start with a quick historical remark. So Kolmogorov announced this statement and give a sketch of the proof. But a formal proof of this took more than 10 years. And after he gave the basic ideas for this to solve this, uh, Arnold used these ideas to prove the following. So Arnold showed that these ideas actually worked improving the analytic linearization linearization of analytic circle maps okay, circle diffeomorphisms close to rotations okay this was the first time that someone showed that this could actually make could work out. And uh, so let me just put some dates. Actually, this was around 54. This was around 61. And later, Moser on 62, again, applied these ideas to show the existence of invariant curves. Invariant curves in area preserving Maps, uh, yeah, two maps for them. Okay, so these two were just a confirmation that these ideas worked, and then uh, it was Arnold who showed uh, gave a full proof of these results. So Arnold then gave a proof of Kolmogorov's result. was in 63 and I forgot to mention something very important here something that was very impressive in this result was that all of this required analytic regularity but Moser managed to make these ideas work in finite regularity which give even more extremes to to this set of ideas and later on so just to finish uh, Moser adapted this and proved Kolmogorov's results. And finite regularity. Okay, and this was around 66. So it's basically this collection of seminal words that say laid down the foundations for KM theory, but ever since it has developed, it has found applications in many other branches, and it's still today, uh, let's say, techniques that are applied for research, and that by tweaking a little bit the methods and the techniques, 
still produce new results. So my objective to, in these two lectures will be to really go in depth in some of the basic ideas. And for this, it will be useful for me to focus on this result rather than this result at first. Basically because it contains the same difficulties, more or less, than this one, but this in a setting that is way more friendly and easier to follow, less technical. So I think it's a good idea, and as surely it's like historically coherent. So let me just write down a plan of what we're going to do in this lecture. So today, lecture one, just continue with some introduction and preliminaries. In lecture two, I hope to discuss and say give a proof, or at least almost complete proof of Arnold's re linearization results. And in the lecture three, I will sketch a proof. It will be really a sketch because I won't be able to cover all the technicalities. I will sketch a proof of Kolmogorov's result. Again, my interest is mostly to for you to understand where all the hypotheses that we will have appear in each of the methods that we're going to use and how the things that we will see here will appear here. So I will just make the analogy between what we did here to obtain a proof here. So this will be a proof from our result. And if the time allows, so I will discuss a little bit of further results or generalizations of this. And um, unfortunately, I will have to omit this part, this contributions of monsters, because it's actually the most technical part, how to reduce this to find a regularity setting. So we'll focus just only on this. Okay. So I just want to emphasize that this was a big breakthrough, so it's probably one of the biggest breakthroughs on dynamical systems in the 20th century, because it actually shed new light in some questions that were open since the time of Juan Carré. Somehow it also invalidated what is, okay, a version what is not like a Boltzmann everybody hypothesis. But we're going to discuss that later because I actually haven't defined anything here, so you are not knowing what I'm talking about. So I will start by defining all the settings, this is what is Hamiltonian, what is this all about, just to define these concepts and to finally give a statement, a proper statement of this. Okay? So, is it clear so far? Um, I will erase here. Going to start by defining um, the Nicolet Hamiltonian formalism. So, sorry, this could be between if you already seen this before. So, what is Hamiltonian? So, a Hamiltonian is just a, is a smooth function. on a symplectic manifold. So we have a smooth function defined here, a smooth real function. This is my symplectic manifold, this is just a close to form. But for me I will not work in any in any symplectic manifold, so in this course We'll only focus on this one. M will be the m-dimensional cylinder, and uh, my symplectic form will be the canonical symplectic form that I can put here, which is given by this d theta i, d i i, and okay, here I'm denoting the coordinates as theta and i. Um, so it turns out that 
in many settings, one can actually reduce to this case. So this is not such a big restriction as it might seem at first, but I'm not going to enter into details of that. So it turns out that one can reduce to this case. This is a consequence of Arnold Uville theorem. But I'm not going to enter into the details of this. So if you are interested, you can see how sometimes one can reduce to this setting. But since we are trying to just get, let's say, an idea of what's going to happen, we'll focus only on here. So usually these are called action angle coordinates. So this is an angle. <laughs> this is the action. And given a Hamiltonian, I want to consider my dynamical system. So what, what will this be? I will define a system of differential equations. So I will consider this system of differential equations. So theta prime of t equal to partial derivative of h with respect to i, theta t, i t, i prime of t equal to minus the derivative with respect to theta h, theta t, i of t. Okay, I have this system of, you can see, 2m differential equations. And um, so if you see, if you see this as a vector field, so if xh is the vector field that define this, vector field defined by these equations. So what's the relation with the symplectic form? So it turns out that xh is the only vector field that verifies this equation. And this is one, how one uses, sorry, canonical, how one uses, uh, sorry, yes? Is h the smooth function of the symplectic form? Yes, thank you. Thank you, thank you, thank you. You should not name it here. Yes, thank you. Um, so, <coughs> um, this vector field is the only one that verifies this equation. That's how one can define Hamiltonian equation uh, <laughs> simply with manifold. And once I have a system of equations, I will define a flow. So, associated to this, I have, so associated to this, we have a flow, the solutions. Define a flow, which I will denote by <coughs> by th. So, what is this flow? Basically, if I take t and I send it to this function, this is the solution of my system with initial conditions. Initial condition at zero, theta i is equal to theta i. Okay, this is the dynamical systems I will be interested in. Why are Hamiltonians an important class? Because actually they give an interpretation of classical mechanics. So physical systems, many physical systems can be interpreted like this. So it's a very important class to investigate. The problem is that we have a system of differential equations. And what happens when we have a system of differential equations? Well, we don't always have access to explicit solutions. And since we want to understand our system, we are not content with only knowing that we have solutions. Existence is not enough for us. So we like to know a little bit more. So luckily, there is a particular class of Hamiltonians for which this system simplifies. So these are called uh, integrable Hamiltonians, when we speak of integrable and near integrable Hamiltonians. What is an integrable Hamiltonian? Hamiltonian H here is called integrable if it does not depend on theta. There's a general definition of integrable. Okay, for me, it will be just only this. And so it's a big restriction. I'm just assuming that my Hamiltonian doesn't depend at all on half of the variables. And because of that, this system reduces greatly. So if I have something like this, this writes just as a function m, then I can write my system as. So this becomes 
theta prime of t is equal to the gradient of n uh, i of t and i prime since n doesn't depend on theta this becomes zero so big simplification and actually because of this I can explicitly solve my system so when I have something like this my Hamiltonian flow looks like this I'm just moving in the first m coordinates so I have something of this kind and my second coordinate is fixed okay so for this particular class we have explicit solutions we understand completely the behavior and now what we would like to say is okay if I understand this one can I say something about a more general one can I actually use this for something because you can imagine this is a big restriction so just one thing I want you to notice is that, as I was saying, the second coordinate is fixed, so this one is fixed. And in the first coordinate I have a <coughs> translation flow, so just notice that uh, this sets, this torus is invariant by the flow, invariant. By the flow. This happens for any i0 that I pick. And the restricted dynamics are given by uh, the translation flow. So let me just introduce some notation that I will use later. So this is just translation flow of this form t theta and I'm sending into theta plus t times r and here this w that we are using is just the gradient of this so this vector here is sometimes called the frequency of my invariant of this invariant torus and I'm mentioning this because this will be very important for us. These dynamics and this vector will play an essential role in what is to come. So I will leave us a, it's a fact, like an exercise, a position you can show. So it turns out that this flow is minimal. So meaning that uh, Every orbit is dense. This happens if and only if this vector is rationally independent. What is rational independent? This means that for any integer vector I pick, this inner product is different from here. Okay, this will play an important role for me. So this is what I'm mentioning now. <laughs> and this is actually we already encountered this flow before in the in the last week, I think in John and David's talk. So if I take for example uh, m equal to 2 meaning that I'm in a two-dimensional torus, this flow is simply I'm taking a point and I'm moving along some direction. Okay, this is my point theta, and I'm moving around t plus t omega. So we saw that, we're, that this flow just will continue like this. Oh, sorry. Like this, like this. And we saw a condition that guaranteed that actually this orbit was dense in every horizontal line. We saw a uh, way to say that this was dense and the criterion was just to say that w1 over w2 was not rational which will translate to this being rational independent okay so this is let's say a gen more general version of this and this will be important for me because this is what i refer as quasi periodic motion so you see when this is minimal this means that when i start here at some point i go back arbitrarily close it will never exactly close, or it will never be periodic, otherwise I cannot be minimal. 
But this is the quasi-periodic motions. And these are the things that I want to preserve of these Hamiltonians. So for the moment, what is happening, I have a Hamiltonian, integrable one, which I know how to solve. And I have these nice invariant sets, invariant tori. All of them have these dynamics. And then I wonder, OK, what if I perturb a little bit? Will I find some of them, or something like this, or not? So now I'm going to define, define what I mean by near integrable. And that will get us closer to a formalist statement. So are there any questions? Sorry. Please, if there are questions, do not hesitate. Forget something. So say that uh, a Hamiltonian of the so Hamiltonian H always here. The Hamiltonian will always live in this manifold. So say that this is near integrable. If I can write it in this form, so at the beginning this will be a little bit vague. So I want to think it as some integrable thing plus some small perturbation. So of course, when I just put it like this, everything can be written in this form. But I'm always thinking of this as some small perturbation in some norm. So I'm always thinking of this as small perturbation of this. This is what I mean by near integral. Okay, it's not a proper definition because I haven't been very clear. But just for you to think, when I say near integrable, small perturbation of this. So. Now I will introduce some notation to see what does it mean to be small in this setting. <coughs> and since I will work in analytic uh, regularity, I will need to introduce some analytic domains. So, um, <laughs> let me fix some constants and define this. So we define an <coughs> analytic neighborhood of the torus. So what I do is I take complex numbers whose imaginary part is smaller than some value. I quotient by the integers and I make this to the end. Okay? So an analytic neighborhood of the m-dimensional torus. And I will use the note like this. The complex ball of radius R. So we consider <coughs> functions defined here, real analytic functions defined in this kind of set of sets. Um, real analytic. And I define some norm. So the norm will be just the supremum over this set. Of this. And t dollar, sorry. Okay, I used I before. Let me keep it with I. Yes? Confused about the analytic neighborhood of the torus. Yes. Um, so it's sort of a two-dimensional object, and we're modding out by the integers. Yes. So it's really like I'm taking the complex numbers and I'm looking at this, at this part, ah, and then yeah, just take this. But in the definition, do you really use absolute value, not the imaginary part? No, I'm using the norm. This is just the norm. Uh, in here, you mean? No, or no, no. no. In the so it's, it's the norm of the, the norm, but like the complex norm. It's just a norm. Yes. So I thought you are nearby. Sorry. So in the theta, so in the theta coordinate and close to the real axis. Here in the, let's say, what do you call the action variables, I just let myself in some ball. Yeah. Okay. Any other questions? 
so what so what I mean by near integrable now is really like I take some integrable and I take some f in some space of this form which has a small analytic norm okay so we're very close to state the main result but as I was telling you this omega these vectors here will play an important role and actually mostly the arithmetic properties of this. So we need to introduce some definitions. So uh, say Diofontaine conditions. So we have encountered this before. Just uh, do it again. So a vector omega here is called Diofontaine if I can find constants uh, gamma bigger than zero constant tau bigger than zero such that the following holds so can write it like this star gamma tau for any integral vector I think here different from zero. So for example here I just wanted this to be different from zero but I will need some quantitative behavior on this. So it will be clear in the following lectures but what I will need is to control this a little bit better. So I want to say that this is bigger or equal than some constant over k to some power okay, plus my dimension. Okay. What is k? Z. Ah sorry. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Um, so this is this is our Diofontaine numbers. So the important thing is that these form a full Lebesgue measure, full Lebesgue measure set. Maybe I can do some more notations. What we use? For notation, I will denote by dc gamma to the set of numbers verifying this. So omega verifies this equation. Denote dc to the union over all positive constants of these sets. And the new frontal numbers are just the union over all positive or equal to zero constants to these sets. Okay, so what will be important for me is that in general these sets have positive measures, so just some facts. So, as I was saying, Diofontaine numbers have full level measure. And if I fix to bigger than zero and gamma is sufficiently small, I think, then this set has positive Lebesgue measure. Okay. Question so far about this? Now, I, think I finally can give a statement of uh, the of Kolmogorov's theorem. So, Kolmogorov's theorem. So, informally, what is what is what I'm saying? Kolmogorov's theorem says that the quasi-periodic motion, so this invariant theorem that we saw, they persist after perturbation. So let me write it informally what this means. A invariant tori with Diofontaine frequency. So remember the frequency was this vector omega that was describing the rotation in my invariant torus. An invariant tori with torus with Diofontaine frequency persists after 
small perturbations. So, what do I mean by persist? It means that the perturbed system has an invariant torus with the same dynamics, basically. So, dynamics that is conjugated to this continuous rotation I was describing before. So, this is informally what it says. And conjugated. Sorry? How conjugated? So, it would be analytically conjugated. Yeah. <laughs> so, this is just like, it's because the statement will be a little bit long, so actually we'll erase the other one and we'll make a lot of things. So, I just want you to keep this in mind. I just have an invariant torus, it has a different time frequency, I perturb, and I will find it in my perturbation. Now we'll make a formal statement. All of this is done in analytic, uh, analytic regularity. It will not hold for like a statement like this for all Hamiltonians. I will need some non-degeneracy conditions, but okay. I will put all of this in a formal statement, but just at least keep this with you while I write the, while I write the formal statement. So I don't want to forget anything. So theorem. Let's come over the theorem. So we'll start with some integral analytic Hamiltonian. So I will put some function here. Real analytic. assumption. Second thing, I want this to be what you say non-degenerate, so what I want is that for every point here, the determinant of this matrix is different from zero. And I will ask that these gradients so again, this gradient was we'll describing the frequency on the invariant torus, on the invariant tori of the integral system. So I want this one to be Diophant time. So for some gamma to bigger than zero, and some point to pick in this ball, but I want it to be a little bit far from the a little bit far from the from the boundary of this ball, just because it would be useful for me. Uh, so I just want it to be a little bit far from this. So under these three assumptions, I want to say that this invariant torus, so again, notice that what this means is that this means that this is an invariant torus for this flow, and it has frequency Call it omega equal to <laughs> this. Okay? So let me put it here omega equal to this. So all I'm saying is under these assumptions, I want to find this invariant torus in my perturbed system. So here I can say that there exists some epsilon. So, so let me fix first some s because I have to fix s. Then I can find some epsilon zero, which will depend on my integral Hamiltonian, on the domain I'm considering, it will depend on these Diophantine constants, such that for any perturbation I pick, so I pick F here, again, this I suppose real analytic, And I suppose, of course, that the norm of this in this is smaller than this epsilon zero. So in this case, then, then the Hamiltonian, so the perturbation H theta i equal to N of i plus F theta i, 
admits an invariant torus whose restricted dynamics is conjugated of oh, dynamics is conjugated to exactly the rotation I want. So to this. And again, yes, sorry, I forgot, it's analytically conjugated. Okay, so this is what I mean by persistence. I can find some torus in my perturbed system that has the same dynamics that I had before. So there are some more precisions that can be made. So this torus is not anywhere. So is that it gets a little bit more technical if I do this, but there are some precisions. So this is basically the statement. So are there any questions about this statement as it is? Yep. Uh, so uh, when s uh, becomes smaller, epsilon uh, also goes to zero. Right? Yes. 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 Um, so this torus is not anywhere. So you can show that this invariant torus. So let me call it uh, t omega. So you can show that t omega is close to the invariant torus we start with. And what I wanted to notice is that here I have explicit dependence on my epsilon. My epsilon depends on the domain I consider, my initial function, and my Geofontaine constants. Which means that I cannot only recover one particular torus, I will recover many tori, all of them, so for any i0 where this happens, I can recover this tori. So I'm recovering a big collection of tori, because remember, this set of Diofantine constant, uh, Diofantine numbers here, have positive Lebesgue measure. So I'm recovering a big family, a big collection of invariant tori. Okay? So the second comment that I wanted to make is that if I take, basically, make the union of all these tori, for all these vectors that are in the Diophantines of this constant, and that are in the intersection of the image of these gradients, so something like this. If I consider this union, this union has positive level measure. Are they the complex numbers modeled out by the Gaussian integers to the nth power, or the real numbers modeled out by the integers to the nth power? This is the, I mean, it's, it will be the, the Gaussian ones, yes. Oh, yes. Yeah. Yes, yes, yes. Um, Sorry, what was the answer? Uh, the Gaussian ones. A plus B. For me, it was just like. You take this, and I'm quotienting this one with the integers through the domain of the torus. Uh, okay, so this is the statement. So is everyone okay with this statement? Okay. Uh, yes. Does it make sense uh, for d equal to one? So the thing is, the thing is that for d equal to one, actually, what will happen is that. Uh, Everything is integrable because if you are in dimension two, basically what will happen is that the Hamiltonian itself is a first integral, and then basically the solutions are the curves given by the energy surfaces. So yeah, it makes sense, but yeah, yeah. Can you explain once again the last statement? So you're saying that uh, for fixed parameters. The so if I fix the Diophantine parameters, uh -huh. I have a positive measure set of vectors here. And to each one of those, I can associate. So, if as long as this gradient belongs to one of those, I have an invariant tori with this frequency for the flow of n. And this means that every time I perturb, I will recover that particular tori in the perturb system. Mm -hmm. So I get a big collection. So basically, because of this assumption that this is different from zero, this will mean that the gradients. So let me say that this is basically, okay, up to reduce r, this is a diffeomorphism. So it's a diffeomorphism onto its image. 
So when I look at the intersection of these with the Diophantine numbers, I have a positive measure set, I have a big set. And for all of those, so for all of those that are here, I have an invariant order. That's it. Okay, so maybe um, some more intuition, just to, to don't keep things completely abstract. So just to keep in mind, So to keep in mind, so what is the example of integrable that I want you to keep in mind? I want you to think of a simplified planar solar system. So I want you to think, my integral Hamiltonian, I want you to think as you have the sun, you have some planets, and you have a simplified solar system, they're in a plane, and I only consider the interaction between the sun and the planets but I ignore the interaction between the planets themselves, okay? So, it turns out that you can reduce this. So, this you can associate a Hamiltonian, and you can reduce this uh, to an integrable system. So, you will probably recognize this from school. You know that the solutions of this are ellipses. Once I simplify my system like this, all my solutions are just ellipses around the sun. So, my solutions are ellipses. And, um, wait, I wanted to say something, but I forgot. Mm. So, my solutions will be ellipses, and you can see this as a system. So, you can, you can see this as a system on the number of planets. So, let me call it M. So this, but this will be integral. So I just have a system that depends here. And what happens is that when I look at my flow, so when I look at this kind of thing, this this vector omega one to omega m is describing the frequencies. Is describing the frequencies of this movement. So basically is one over the period. It's telling me how fast I am turning here. So I make simplification instead of thinking this as ellipses. All of them are circles. So when I look at the solutions, all the movements simultaneously, I have n planets, I have some movement in the torus. So I have a flow in the torus that we had before. <coughs> okay? And then I look at the relation between these frequencies. So I look at the relation between the periods of my planets. And then they start, let's say that whether I can apply my theorem or not to this kind of thing depends in how these periods relate to each other. So basically, I already want them to be rational independent. So I don't want them to synchronize at some point. This would be something bad for me. Okay? So this will be the integrable scenario I want you to keep in mind. And the near integrable scenario will be, of course, say, a simplified body problem where I can just assume again I have the sun, have the planets. But this time, I will not ignore the interaction between the planets. Okay, have some small interaction here. And then comes the reductions. The idea is that if you assume that the sun is very massive compared to the others, these pores that I have here, is just a small perturbation of the system I had before. Okay? So it somehow tries to see our a normal solar system as a perturbation of the perfect one. And if one could apply this kind of result to this, it will mean that this system has a lot of regular solutions, okay, of quasi-periodic motions. So I mentioned at the beginning that these, all of these results were pretty remarkable because they shed light on some questions by Poincaré. So I just wanted to mention on this, uh, in the 19th century, Poincaré already showed that, for example, the three-body problem is very unstable. So he showed that there are solutions which behave very chaotically, and the fact that you could mathematically, let's say, say see this, this chaos was counterintuitive with the observations that, for example, astronomers had. All the movements that we see are always very regular, almost ellipses, and everything seems so tame. And then it was a little bit paradoxical that these two things could coexist. How can this chaotic behavior that can, you, you can, let's say, expect from mathematics how can it 
coexist with this very tame behavior of elliptical orbits. And the point is that no one knew exactly how to find many of these orbits or why to expect these orbits to really happen all the time. So it was not clear what was the typical case. Either you have always something very chaotic or your solutions are mostly tame or what is, what is happening. So this result actually showed that it is possible to have this. It's possible to have big parts of your space where you have some uh, very tame behavior. And at the same time, this doesn't contradict the existence of some chaotic orbits, okay? So this was very remarkable. And again, I, I mentioned this ergodic, ergodic hypothesis, which vaguely means that if you restrict yourself to an energy surface, so if you restrict yourself to some set of this form, you can show that any solution that starts here for your Hamiltonian stays here forever. And then there was this, let's say, statement who vaguely said that if this was compact, one would expect that for a typical Hamiltonian, the solutions here will behave ergodically. So I will have some ergodic behavior. But the fact that I'm able to construct these this kind of things, these kind of, of sets, shows that this cannot hold. So this basically gives you invariant sets of positive measures that are not of full measure in energy surfaces, so you cannot be ergodic. So this is what this theorem when it was stated was quite remarkable. And so the objective is to be able to say something about this in the third lecture. But now I'm going to abruptly change completely the subject. So are there any questions before I completely change the subject? And is there a relation between those energy level sets with the invariant zones? So the point is that you can show, so there is an other condition that is called Arnold isoenergetic condition that will guarantee, for example, that every energy surface has some invariant tori. But it may happen that some of these energy surfaces don't have invariant tori. So what you expect is that most of these energy surfaces have invariant tori, but you can show, you can construct examples where some, there are some energy surfaces where there is no invariant tori. Okay, so as I was telling you before, I, my goal is this, but we will start with the circle case. Because the circle case is a little bit simpler, it's less technical, and um, it keeps most of the difficulties. So we are going to start with that one. So in the minutes I have left, I'm just going to introduce the preliminaries of the circle so that next time I can just start directly with the proof. And let me erase. Now we're going to circle maps. So we'll be interested in circle diffeomorphism. So we shouldn't use F since I use F before the news. Yes, fine. Circle diffeomorphism. interested in the linearization of this. So let me start by this, recalling some of the basics of the theory of circle maps. So there is a very famous result by Langeois. states the following. So if you have, if f is a circle diffeomorphism of class C1 plus bounded variation. So this means that this C1 continues derivative and the derivative has bounded variation. But if you like this, you can imagine this as being C2. That is enough. And since we are going to be analytic, we are all always on the safe side. This will hold. So if you have a circle diffeomorphism with without periodic points, and it is sufficiently regular, regular, then uh, F is conjugated to an uh, irrational circle rotation. So my notation for circle rotations will be similar to what we had before. Just take a point and I send to x plus alpha. 
and here well, I'm supposing that alpha is irrational. Okay, so one can show it's uh, uh, exercise. So sorry, what do I mean by conjugated? I should have said this. What do I mean by it is conjugated? It means that this means that there exists some map H. Uh, homeomorphism, which verifies the following h composed with f is equal to r alpha composed with h. Okay, so one can check that uh, that this conjugacy is unique up to composing it with a rotation. So up to composition with a rotation. And then it, is, it makes sense to wonder what is the regularity of this. So in the statement before, in this Kolmogorov of theorem, we saw that our invariant tori are analytically conjugated to some rotation. So here, maybe I would like to expect the same. I would like to say, okay, maybe I'm analytic, maybe this conjugacy is analytic. Uh, but it turns out that just like this, this is not, this is not true, basically. <laughs> So what happens, so there's some, say, some theorem, it's just an example. So by Arnold, so there exists analytic, sorry, I think I used F, but I was using V here, not this. Okay, no, I'll call it F. Uh, there exists analytic uh, circle, Diffeomorphisms uh, without periodic points whose, let me call conjugacy to rotation, so whose conjugacy to rotation. Is not C1. So it turns out that regularity alone doesn't help us. I cannot just expect to be analytic and say, okay, this will work out. So there is something more that will be needed, some arithmetic things, some arithmetic property we're missing, as in the previous case. So this, to state this, I will need to introduce the notion of rotation number. Rotation number for circle maps. So, what is the rotation number? Uh, if I have a homeomorphism here, so let me say that this orientation preserving to be on the safe side. And I pick any lift of this transformation. So, I pick a map going from R to R. Uh, homeomorphism, uh, so a lift of f. So what does it mean to be a lift? It just means that pi composed with f is equal to f composed with pi, where pi is the projection of the real numbers onto the torus, which actually x and to x minus 1. Okay? And using this lift, one can define what is called the rotation number as the limit when n goes to infinity of the iterates of this map over n. So, so if you have seen this before, you will recognize you know what is the rotation number. Otherwise, Okay, then this is the formal definition, but what it's trying to encode is how much, how much my map f is turning points in average. So what I'm doing here is I'm taking a point, so I'm taking just a circle map, I have a circle homeomorphism, I have a point, and I'm looking at the secrets. And I'm just trying to count how many times I am turning 
around in average along this point. What is that to define formally this notion of how many times I turn around? I have to go to the lift because here I just get lost when I make one turn. And you can show that this limit actually doesn't depend on the starting point. If I take modulus 1 here, this will not depend on the lift. So this is a well-defined quantity. Moreover, one can show that this is an invariant by conjugacy. Meaning that in this Danjoa theorem where I had this conjugated to a rotation, this alpha is not any alpha. This alpha is my rotation number. So I know exactly who, who this is. And this is the quantity. So this, is, this invariant was introduced by Poincaré and it's probably the most important invariant for circle maps. And it's here that I will encode the arithmetic property that I need to improve the regularity of my conjugacy. Okay? So um, I will define something that is very, very close to very, very close to the Ophantine numbers. And perhaps I will just state the theorem and I will stop here for today. So want to encode some arithmetic property. So, uh, I take some irrational number. And, uh, if I take two constants, so as before, I take two constants gamma to bigger than zero, and I will say that alpha is of type gamma to if for any uh, p and q here, so one of them has to be different from zero, a q times alpha minus <coughs> p is bigger or equal than gamma over q one plus so. And here I probably want q to be different from zero. Okay, so it's almost as what I define for the often time. The point here is that now I'm saying I'm not only different from zero, I'm far from integers. So let's say it's a stronger property than being the often time. Sometimes it's also referred to as being the often time. But since I already use the word the often time, this time I'm calling it type. But it's basically as being the often time. And this is the property that will work out for us. So what is the Arnold theorem of linearization? So So I will not state it formally because I will have to, I will start with it next time, but just what is the, <coughs> the intuitive idea? If, if I start with some alpha of type gamma to for some gamma to, then Small analytic permutations, analytic permutation, uh, perturbations that we call the perturbation. So I take a perturbation of this particular rotation. So again, I will have to introduce some analytic domain to make make sense of what this is a small, but I will do that next time. So if you have some small analytic perturbation of a rotation, and the rotation number of this one is the same as this one, otherwise, again, the rotation number is an invariant by conjugacy. If I want to be conjugated to this one, I have to have the same rotation number, otherwise it does, it's not working. So if I have an analytic perturbation, I have this. Uh, so these analytic permutations are analytically conjugated to our alpha. Okay, so you can see a little bit the similarities to what we had before. The alpha is somehow playing a role of this integrable thing we had. I perturb and I want to go back to something like this. Okay? So the proof of this will use the same kind of schema as 
as will appear in the other one. And I will try to explain the scheme next time. And uh, that's more or less what I wanted to tell you today. So thank you. Uh, so in the uh, Kalmogorovsky theorem, uh, the condition uh, on alpha in the one-dimensional case will be just empty, correct? Uh, so sorry, can you repeat the condition on? In the Kalmogorovsky theorem, yeah. the condition of being Diophantine uh, in the one-dimensional case is just empty condition, right? Uh, yes, I mean basically a yeah, difference from zero, yeah. I see. Yes. I didn't follow. Because basically the only thing that, I mean, I mean the Diophantine condition that you need in the Hamiltonian setting is weaker. So you yeah, yeah, only to be different uh, from zero. It's, 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 it's different setting in a sense. So you have yes. more space and you yes, yes, move yes. a little bit, you don't act on the same set. So yes, yes. This is, this is power. Yeah. And if I understand the difference between Diophantine uh, uh, property here and there, is because one of them is for if you also the other is for flow. Exactly. Basically. That's the thing. More questions? Thanks again. Thank you.